Hello, and welcome to the sec section of the course with pre-recorded um, lectures regarding different topics. I am Maria Bieling at UT Southwestern Medical Center. I work mostly or only in the pediatric otolaryngology section of our uh, department. I was asked to speak to you about the importance of the sense of smell in our everyday lives. I have no disclosures at, uh, regarding this talk or any others for that matter. My objectives are that I hope that at the end of this conversation you're able to understand the different types of smell disorders, to discuss how they affect our daily lives um, and the consequences of such. We will start with some definitions regarding the different types of smell disorders. So we divide them mostly into quantitative and qualitative. So quantitative just has to do with how much smell we're perceiving. So either no smell at all, which is what anosmia usually relates to, although you gotta keep in mind that some patients are still gonna have some um, perception of smell through the trigeminal stimulation, but overall it means an absence of smell in general. Hyposmia, on the other hand, relates to the decreased sense of smell that a lot of patients experience, uh, and these are the more common uh, disorders. We also have the qualitative disorders, which have a lot to do with neurologic disorders, but can also be a part of chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, post-viral uh, infections, head trauma, et cetera. We, just, we divide these into parosmia, which is a distorted order perception, and that means things like um, you're smelling a bouquet of roses and it smells like a poopy diaper, for example, or phantasmia, which is where there's nothing there for you to smell, but yet you're perceiving the smell of something. Um, we also um, talk about olfactory disorders as either acquired or congenital. The more common disorders are acquired, and the most common reason for an acquired dysfunction is usually a viral infection. But we also look at these as to whether they're conductive, kind of like hearing, conductive, sensorineural hearing, sensorineural, or uh, central dysfunction. With conduction, it has to do with the smell um, particles reaching the olfactory bulbs, so things like a chronic rhinosinusitis, polyposis, anything that diminishes the airflow into the nose can certainly account for some of these. Sensor neural has to do with um, the nerve not working appropriately, and then central dysfunction has to do with the brain's perception of the smell. There are also congenital um, senses of uh, either olfactory disorders or, or lack of smell, and they have to do mostly with a hypoplastic or aplastic olfactory bulb, but more recently they've also been described um, in a clinical spectrum of various diseases, as I've listed for you here, and also been noted to be present in diseases such as the 22Q11 uh, deletion syndrome, cystic fibrosis, and the CHARGE syndrome. How prevalent are these disorders? Well, it turns out that they're fairly prevalent. About a fifth of the population appears to be affected by some type of olfactory disorder. Uh, and the interesting part of this is that, unlike most other diseases, the self-reported loss is significantly lower than the actual um, prevalence of the disease. So most people that have a deficit in smell are not aware of the fact that it is there. We know, as I mentioned a minute ago, that the most common causes of smell disorders have to do with viral infections, but certainly sinus disease is a big contributor, again, because of the lack of airflow into the nose and up to the olfactory bulb. We also have head trauma, exposure to certain medications, and as I mentioned, congenital also um, add to or contribute to these disorders. So why is it important that we smell well? Well, there is a um, olfactory, olfaction is an essential aspect of the human physiology and an important feature of everyday life and well-being. So it ranges from things like the ability to perceive taste um, to things that are safety issues related to the ability to perceive um, smells of gas, fire, spoiled food, etc. So it affects a lot of different areas in our lives and depending on the significant how much of it you have, it does really affect your well-being overall. Um, so as I mentioned before, we talk about enjoyment of food. That's a big issue when you can't smell it. 
Um, you have the patients that really lose their appetite when they um, are unable to smell what they're about to eat, and they, it, this results in significant weight loss. At the beginning of the pandemic, or maybe a year into it, I did get a lot of referrals of children who were losing, losing significant amount of weight because they refused to eat. They did nothing tasted good to them. They didn't want to eat. They were losing weight to the point where the physicians were concerned. And we ended up doing a lot of nutritional referrals to help them uh, deal with the deficit, to help them um, inc increase their um, caloric intake and therefore maintain their weight. And then you have the opposite end of the spectrum of those patients who were eating way more than they normally ate in an effort that if they had enough food, they could taste it better. So definitely a big problem with um, the uh, quality of life related to food intake. But there's also the other things I mentioned to you uh, related to hazard avoid avoidance. There's problems with social, situ social situations where patients feel uncomfortable not knowing uh, if they're able to tell if they're smelling, if they have bad breath. I mean, just different things for different people, but it does affect their ability to interact with other people, uh, which of course uh, ends up reducing the quality of life. Um, the studies have shown that in addition to what I just mentioned, there's about a third of the patients uh, who report smell disorders who also s complain of significant diminished quality of life with depressive symptoms, which are shown by their uh, decrease in daily activities and so on. Um, it is known that the severity and the duration of the impairment definitely influence uh, the quality of life so that the more pronounced um, the deficit is, the more anxiety and depressive symptoms the patient will have. On the other side, um, the patients were able to develop better coping strategies being through um, therapy, support of their loved ones, et cetera, do much better as far as the quality of life. So how do we treat these um, patients? It turns out that, obviously, like with everything else in medicine, the treatment is geared at whatever the cause of the problem is. So depending on what the, the issue is, we have different approaches. Uh, for those with loss due to viral infections and some type of neurologic damage, we talk about smell training, which has had a mixed um, responses, but overall it certainly doesn't hurt anything and it does appear to help in the long run. We talk about um, increasing nasal patency, and we do that with nasal steroid application. And the appropriate patient surgery would be uh, indicated uh, in order to clear the pathway in the nose, and that has to do with rhin uh, rhinosinusitis as well as polyps, et cetera. In addition to that, it's important to um, allow them to um, have psychological support, and this has to do with therapy, it has to do with uh, social acceptance with support at home, uh, with different tech, you know, different approaches that work different for each patient, but certainly the recognition is there that this has to be um, addressed, recognized, and the more that the patient is supported, the better they seem to do. So in summary, recently COVID has become a big contributor to this um, dysfunction of the olfactory um, sense or the sense of smell. Um, and it really is one of the char challenges, and I think in our specialty, to help these patients overcome this. One thing I didn't mention earlier in the treatment is that the fact that time can be your friend. Certainly some of these are likely to, are resolving as um, with time, and so supporting the patient until that happens is extremely important. Um, many people who have olfactory dysfunction or diminished smell are not even aware of it, which leads to a di delay in diagnosis and management. Uh, but those that are severely affected, I think, are very um, early, identified early and treated as best as we can. We need to keep in mind the fact that this loss of the sense of smell has a big impact on the patient's life that they will need support via through therapy, through counseling, through family support, um, strategies to keep them safe, um, to keep them um, eating well so that they don't lose so much weight, et cetera. All of these things combined will um, help the patient get through or at least adjust to their deficit um, 
and hopefully make their quality of life better. I thank you for your attention. If I met you, if you're listening to this before um, the course, I hope to meet you there. Otherwise, I hope you, um, to have had a good interaction. Thank you so much.